So the reading coming from Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teachers, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they said. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died. And since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do keep your Bible open if you've uh, got it, page 990. What do you think of questions? What kind of questions? Sometimes we dread being asked a question we don't know how to answer or don't want to answer. Prime Minister's questions is one of the most interesting things to see in Parliament. With teenagers in our house, exam questions are often quite topical as are interview questions. One of my favorite books is Randy Newman, um, Questioning Evangelism, Engaging People's Hearts the Way Jesus Did. And he advocates answering a question with a question. Often it helps to ask people questions in conversation, particularly if we're wanting to introduce them to the Lord Jesus rather than tell them things that they may not be interested in hearing. And the most important question we can be asked is the one I'm about to say. It may not be the best opening gambit in conversation, but it is one that we all need to face up to sooner or later. The most important question is, what do you think of Jesus? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to be honest with our questions and help us to think seriously and rightly about this big question this morning. Speak to us, we pray. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bible open at page 990, uh, Matthew 22, verse 15, where the reading began, we meet some characters called the Pharisees. They were ultra-strict religious Jews in Jesus' day. They were really hot on keeping the details of Jewish law. People admired them for their religious devotion and seriousness. But we've met them already as we've been reading through Matthew and they have taken a dislike to Jesus. Chapter 21 verse 12 was quite provocative on Jesus' part. He entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and said some strong words that wound up the religious people. And so in last week's reading, uh, still in chapter 21, but on on today's page, verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. And that's the context for verse 15, which we come to today. The Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. So the question they're going to ask him is not going to be the kind of honest question where the purpose is to find out the answer. It's going to have a landmine concealed under it. I wonder how Jesus felt as they introduced it so flatteringly. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what's your opinion? Is it right to pay, tax, pay the poll tax to Caesar or not? It's a clever challenge. Because, of course, if Jesus says, yes, it's right to pay the tax, all these crowds of people that are following Jesus aren't going to like it. Jesus is going to lose his popularity. But on the other hand, if he says, no, it's not right to pay this tax, well, all they have to do is report him to the Roman authorities and he'll be in big trouble. So 
He's in a dilemma. And seeing through their evil intent is not that difficult really, is it? But the fact that he saw through it doesn't in itself get him out of the dilemma. Jesus' answer does. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. Is simply saying what's obviously true. They should pay the right thing. They should pay what is rightfully due. And looking at the image on the coin draws attention to the fact that it was minted by the Romans and people may have been saying, what have the Romans ever done for us? But at the same time, they were benefiting from the peace, transport and commerce made possible by them. But Jesus isn't getting into debate about how good or bad the government is and how fair the tax system is. The fact that government has the right to raise money by taxes, that's a fact. It has that right. So just swallow that unpalatable fact. Jesus shifts the focus, though, by not stopping with saying that. And give to God what is God's is the bigger challenge. Jesus is raising more questions here. Why did he say that? What is God's? What should I give to God? Is it 10% of my income? What about wealth? Am I putting the right amount in the collection? Am I remembering to review my giving and my standing order annually? Well, those questions don't get to the heart of what Jesus means. The image of Caesar showed what belonged to Caesar. So, if the image of God shows what belongs to God, what, what is that? What belongs to God? Where do we see his image? You probably know Genesis 1 verse 27. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God's image is stamped on every human being everyone now damaged but everyone still belonging to him so Jesus says to every human being you belong to God your life is not your own to do what you want with now how do you respond to that if you're a Pharisee's disciple that's been trying to trap Jesus You've been hoist with your own petard. Verse 22, when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. And then another group turned up. The Sadducees were another strict Jewish group. These guys more closely associated with the temple and the priests. They didn't get on well with the Pharisees, surprisingly enough, perhaps, because they disagreed on some fundamentals. The Pharisees took the whole Old Testament as God's word, whereas the Sadducees accepted only the first five books as authoritatively God's word. And they disagreed over life and death because the Pharisees believed in a resurrection and the Sadducees didn't believe in any resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. So their question is clearly not in good faith because, as Matthew's told us, they, they don't believe in the resurrection. And the question goes, now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven since all of them were married to her? Let's notice four things from Jesus' reply. First thing to notice, all views are not equally valid. Jesus didn't say, interesting point, but... There is another way of looking at it. Verse 29, Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. There's right and wrong defined by the scriptures. All views are not equally valid. Second thing to notice, marriage is not permanent. 
At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. There is no marriage in the age to come, except that we will all together be married to Jesus. When we marry in this age, it's till death us do part. And at that point, the marriage bond is finished. And it becomes okay to marry another. This ending of a marriage bond can be quite hard to accept when we first hear it from Jesus. I don't know what our relationships with loved ones will be like in the resurrection age, but they will be different from how they are now. And if we find that distressing, the thought that we won't be married to our present marriage partner uh, in the life beyond death, we need to learn to appreciate our relationship with Jesus so much more that we see this future of unrivaled intimacy with him as good news. Jesus presents it as good news. Third thing to notice, death is not final. Jesus is clear that there is a life beyond death. You can see it in those early books of the Bible that the Sadducees accept. They, they thought that the hope of resurrection only appeared in the later prophetic books, which they rejected. But God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. He said, I am the God of Abraham. Implying, according to Jesus, that Abraham is not finished and did not cease to be and to know God when he died. And fourth thing to notice, God's word is not limited to its time. Have you not read, verse 31, what God said to you? What God said to Moses in Exodus 3 verse 6, he said, according to Jesus, to you, that is to the Pharisees in Jesus' day, and therefore to you and me in our day. So is Jesus a Pharisee then? He does believe in the resurrection like the Pharisees. In verse 34, the Pharisees start thinking, hmm, maybe he's not so bad after all. He can put those shadows in their place. So I wonder if the guy in verse 35 is bringing a more honestly testing question. Which is the most important commandment in God's law? He wants to know for himself. He wants to know what Jesus thinks. Jesus expands then on the implications of what he'd said in verse 21. How do you give to God what is God's if you belong to God? And for Jesus, we see it is not about detailed rule keeping. It's all about love. How much should I love God? Well, how would you answer that question? What is the appropriate level of love for a person to have for God? And I don't mean what would you say in church if I made you say it out loud now, or to me, or in a Bible study if you're trying to give the right answer and what is expected. I mean, if you're honest, what do you actually think? Many of us have a fear of extremism. We want to keep everything in moderation. It's good to have a faith, but keep it in proportion. Don't let it take over your life. We might be concerned if our children or grandchildren were too pious and worry that it might stop them getting on in life. What if they started talking about missionary service overseas? Would that be OTT? Jesus says, you belong to God totally. Give your whole self to him. This is not the first verse of the hokey cokey you put your right hand in. Verse 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, not with a reasonable proportion of your heart, and with all your soul, all your life, and with all your mind, not with a significant part of your mind, or the bits of Jesus' teaching that you already agree with yourself. You 
Put your whole self in. Just don't take it out again and shake it all about. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we might ask ourselves, how have I been doing on keeping these two commands? The Pharisees have the mentality where they see God's word as a set of boxes to tick. Yes, I keep this law. Yes, I've done that. And then Jesus says, this is the first and greatest command. Can you tick that box? I know I can't. I've fallen at the first hurdle. I've failed. And I wonder if that Pharisee who asked Jesus the question realized that. We all need forgiveness. We don't have a leg of our own to stand on before God. We're in a desperate spiritual situation. Call an ambulance. And this is where Jesus brings good news. The Bible they knew, we call it the Old Testament, the first three quarters of our Bible, promised a rescuer, a king, someone who was going to come and save God's people and put everything right. The Messiah. Messiah, or Christ, which is the Greek version of the word, means anointed one and so as Jesus turns the tables on his questioners in verse 41 he asks them a question what do you think about the Messiah now you and I know that Jesus is the Messiah we recognize that question as the same one that I began this sermon with the most important question who what do you think of Jesus and Peter had answered that question in chapter 16, verse 16, remember, when he said to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. But the Pharisees had not yet come to that conclusion. So Jesus is pushing them to think about it. How can the son of David be the Lord of David? If Jesus is the Messiah, will he be accepted as Lord? The Christ, the Messiah, is the rescuer king. If we want him to be our rescuer, we need to have him as our king. Jesus is saviour and lord. If we want him to be our saviour, we must have him as our lord. And if we have him as our lord, he will be our saviour. This is great news. It means we're adopted as God's children and treated as if we loved God the way Jesus did with his whole heart, soul, and mind. Not by ticking every box and keeping all of God's law, not by being really good at loving God with our whole heart, but by relying on him as our king bowing the knee before him, submitting to him. Are you ready to say, Jesus is Lord? The skeptics who were questioning Jesus were not, so they couldn't answer his question. They were stunned into silence. Verse 46, no one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. In the end, we all either fall at his feet and bow to him as our king, or we end up walking away and having nothing more to do with him. This is the most important choice we will ever make. What do we think of Jesus? Jesus.